Hey y'all, it's Brittany and welcome back. This week's installment of Makeup and Murder is going to be all about the McStay family. So if you wanna hear all the details on this mystery, where did the McStay family go? Then stay tuned. Okay, you guys, before we jump into the story, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed to my channel, everyone who has been watching and even binge watching my true crime videos, my other videos. I do fragrance videos, I do hair videos, makeup videos. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who has subscribed and has watched. I am growing so fast. I am so proud. I am so happy that you guys are enjoying what I'm putting out. So I just wanted to say a quick thank you. And also, if you have not subscribed already, make sure that you subscribe to my channel. Make sure that you hit that notification bell and make sure that you like the video, y'all. Now let's hop right into the story of the McStay family. Now I'm gonna be trying out a new primer this week and that is the Pretty Filter Icy Sherbert Primer. And I've heard really good things about it. The texture is crazy, but once you mix it all up and rub it in, it feels great. So I'm interested to try this out. I'm on my way to Mexico in a few days. So this cooling primer will be really cool for me to bring along with me on my trip. And then I'm just gonna take my Milk Makeup Clear Brow Gel and So just a little bit of background, y'all know I always like to start off on the background of our victims, giving them a story, giving you guys a feel of who these people were. And this one is no different. So Joseph McStay was born in Plano, Texas, and it was him and his brother. And he, like I said, grew up in Texas and at a young age, I think it was around eight or so, his parents divorced and he moved with his mom to Southern California after she got a job out there. Now, he still stayed very close with his father, so his family overall still had a very close relationship despite the divorce. And as a kid, he enjoyed doing things like dirt bike riding, surfing, typical, you know, California kid stuff. So. No, you know, nothing crazy going on in his background. Just an all around cool kid with a very close relationship with his family. Now, during his early adulthood, Joseph, who they called Joey, he started a water fountain business. And I don't mean like the water fountains that you drink out of. I mean like these beautiful stone slate water fountains that were used in hotels and salons and spas and just any beautiful place you can think of. He built those types of fountains. So he started it pretty young in his early 20s, I want to say, and it grew really rapidly. And it actually grew so fast from a small local business to starting to get global kind of recognition in business. He hired a friend of his named Dan Cavanaugh and Dan was supposed to set up his website to make it easier to manage the business, to get more publicity out there as well. And him and Dan were really good friends as kids too. They both liked to do the same things. They liked to surf. They did a lot of those things together. So it just felt like a good fit to work with his friend in business. I personally don't do business mixed with friends or family um, because I'm a person who needs business to be handled very professionally and I don't play about my money. So I just don't mix friends or family with business. But it seemed to work very well for Dan and Joey. Now, Joey McStay also hired a additional person as kind of a subcontractor. He would do the welding and things like that where Joey would work with the stone and the slate. And his name was Charles Chase Merritt, and most people refer to him as Chase. Now, in 2004, he met a beautiful real estate agent by the name of Summer Martelli, and things progressed pretty quickly with them. They ended up being pregnant within months of meeting and getting together, 
and they had their first son whose name was Gianni. The couple then married in 2007 and they had their second son, Joey Jr., shortly after being married. And then after they got married, they moved to Fallbrook, which was a, you know, nice, quiet, suburban kind of area. And a couple months after they moved to Fallbrook, which was about February 2010, the whole family goes missing. Now, at first, the family was not really worried about not hearing from Summer and Joey. They usually would take trips to um, different places where maybe they didn't have the best of sales service. So the family didn't really think a whole lot of it for the first couple of days while they were missing. But the last time anyone from the family had heard from Joey or Summer or anyone was February 4th. And the father had said that he had spoke to his son. It was kind of a rushed conversation. He had a business meeting around lunchtime. So he was trying to hurry up and get off the phone. And that was really the last time that anyone from the family had spoken to the, anybody in the McStay family. Now I'm just going to color correct really quick with my Born This Way concealer. So... On February 13th, which is nine days from the last time that anybody in the family heard from them, the brother, Mike, goes over to Joey and Summer's house to see if anyone is home. And he goes at the request of his mom, who's very worried about her child. Understandably, they haven't heard from them in nine days. So when the brother gets there, he notices that there's a lot of things that just don't look right, don't make any sense. And he realizes that the car is gone. They drive in a a Suzu and the car is gone, but he goes in through a window. And this is, look, if I ever go missing, I don't care. Family, however you need to get into my home to check on me, I'm not mad at you, okay? He goes into a window and gets into the home. When he gets in the home, he sees that there's like eggs and just food left out that's rotting and decaying. He sees things like prescription glasses and sunglasses and personal effects that he thinks that either Summer or Joey would have taken with them if they were going on a vacation of any type. So he just doesn't feel good about the situation whatsoever. And then I'm gonna take my Sephora Best Skin Ever Foundation and this is in 56. 0.5p. Now, even after that, the family tried to give them a few more days to come home and they didn't. So he called, they call the police and they report the entire mixed day family missing. Now, mind you, it is Joey, his wife, Summer, and then their two boys, Gianni and Joey Jr. So on the 19th, the police start their search for the mixed day family. And when they look at the home, it looks like There's no sign of a struggle, but it looks like they left in a hurry. Things were not cleaned up, nothing was put away. And that just felt a little bit off to the police officers. I don't think it was off enough for them to feel like something bad had happened. There was no signs of, like I said, a struggle or an attack or anything like that. But it just looked like they had picked up and just got up out of there real fast. They canvassed the area, they talked to neighbors, they talked to friends and family and tried to piece together kind of what was going on in the upcoming days on the day that they went missing. And what they find is on February 4th, Summer and Joey had kind of been communicating back and forth for the pretty much the entire day here and there. And then the last communication that they see between Summer and Joey is at 5.45 that evening or so. And all communication just stops after that. There is no calls, no text messages. There is no type of activity period from either party, not just on their phones, nothing after that point. Now, when they talked to their friends, they realized that Chase Merritt was the last person that actually spoke with Joey. And he said that when he spoke with Joey, Joey said he was on his way home. He might've been like stopping to pick up food for the family for dinner or something like that, but he was definitely on his way home on the night of the 4th. Police also, you know, they go around and they collect friends and family's DNA just in case, because right now they still consider it missing. They don't, they don't have any reason to think some harm was done to any of the family members, but just in case they collect everybody's DNA and they kind of wait 
They can't really access any of the financial records yet because again, it's still just a missing persons case where they don't have any reason to think anything bad happened or they left involuntarily. Now I'm just gonna take my Dose of Colors concealer and brighten my under eye area. Now about three weeks later, police find a neighbor who actually has some surveillance footage that actually might be of some help to them in the search of the family. So what they find on this surveillance video is they see a vehicle leaving out of the driveway of the McStay family. And they can kind of see like the bottom part of the of the license plates of the vehicle and they decide you know let's check this out let's run this and see who this belongs to and it was the mcstay's isuzu that was seen leaving their driveway and when they run their plates they find out that the vehicle was actually towed from a shopping center that is right at the border crossing of mexico so Police go, they look at the, they go look for the car. They find the car and they, of course, take it into custody. Now, being that the location of the car was right at the border, they feel like it could be a possibility that they just went to Mexico. So they check the surveillance footage of the border to see if there's any families that were seen crossing the border that look like the mixed days. Looks like there's an adult and a woman and two small boys crossing over into Mexico. Now the car was towed from the shopping center four days after they went missing. So on February 8th is when the car was towed, but they took the car into custody and they took fingerprints, they took DNA samples, all of the above for processing. Now, when they look at this surveillance footage, they do find a family that looks just like the McStay's family. And they take this surveillance footage to the family being Joey's parents. And they ask them, you know, is this your son? Does this look like it could be your family? And the mom says right off the bat, that's not my son. He don't walk like that. That's not him. That is not the family. But the police were so hung up on the possibility of that being the family and them possibly crossing over into Mexico and not coming back and leaving their car. They really didn't value that that comment from the mom. They really didn't consider that, no, it's not her son. That is not her son. That is not her family crossing the border. Also, while all of this is going on, investigators are also looking at the computer that was at the McStay house. And it was said to be Summer's computer. What they found on Summer's computer was a, there were a bunch of searches like how to get to Mexico, how to cross the border, uh, different things like that. And she also had reached out to someone, it looked like per the computer, that she was reaching out to someone to acquire or purchase a Rosetta Stone program of how to learn, you know, how to speak Spanish. So this was another aspect that kind of fed into the investigators theory that they went to Mexico. They just ran off and went to Mexico and didn't tell nobody because this computer that they had that was in the home has all these searches about Mexico and speaking Spanish. And we have a family that's on camera that kind of looks like them. So their car was parked right by the border. So why wouldn't it be them? And the family just felt like, all of that may be there. All of what you're saying could be true. That could all be there, but they would never leave for this long of a period of time and not say anything. If they were starting a new life, whatever it is, they would never leave without saying goodbye, letting us see the kids, any inkling that they were planning to go live in another country. You just don't pick up and leave when everything is going just fine. Now I'm gonna take my vanity makeup contour and conceal palette and i am going to use the darkest color for a little bit of contour i'm also going to take a little bit of the contour and put it on my nose so the family actually goes down to mexico and they start to pass out flyers they start to ask people questions and probably in some of the most dangerous neighborhoods you'd probably find they did not care they were going in mexico to find their people while they're doing that the FBI 
issues a bolo or a be on the lookout for the McStay family or anyone that looks like the McStay family in Mexico because they're still rolling with the theory that they went to Mexico. They just picked up and they went to Mexico. And But while the family was doing their canvassing and they were working the border and Mexico, they ran into someone named Bob who had mentioned that he saw the McStay family in a grocery store while he and his family was grocery shopping. And they, of course, passed this information along to the police and it ended up not being the McStay family. Now I'm gonna take my Laura Mercier translucent powder and set my under eye. And then I am going to use my deep powder to set the contouring cream that I use as well. Theories also start to surface that you know, maybe Joey was a part of a drug cartel. He was working with the drug cartel. And I really hate personally when these type of theories crop up because it just makes me feel like the only thing that people associate Mexico with is drugs and cartels, bad stuff. And it just irks my nerves because I know that Mexico is a beautiful place. There, It's a beautiful place to visit, travel, live, grow up in. And it's not just about cartels and drugs. Now, one other thing that the family does start to do is they start to work through both Summer and Joey's emails to see if there's any leads there, if they can, you know, find any suspects or people that they should be talking to, persons of interest, should I say. And they do find some interesting things in the emails. So one thing that they find in the email for Summer is, she was getting emails from her ex-boyfriend whose name was Vic. He was the boyfriend that she had right before she met Joey. And he just knew that they were supposed to be soulmates. They were meant to be together. He doesn't care kind of what is going on, who else she met. He could care less. So he would contact her. And this kind of led people to question, you know, is, is she still involved with him? Was there an affair going on? Is he angry about her, you know, having this life with someone else? And would he be angry enough to actually hurt her and her family? And on top of this, Vic was not a nice guy by any means. He had a lot of trouble with the law. He was arrested for threatening to kill a neighbor and her daughter. He was also arrested in a bar that was actually very close to, to Joey McStay's office. He was definitely a prime suspect that police really wanted to talk to about the whereabouts of the McStay family. But when police talk to him, they're able to actually rule him out and he had a rock solid alibi. So it wasn't, it wasn't Vic. Now, another person that they also talked to is the business partner of Joey, who is Dan Kavanaugh. Now, as the family was working its way through the emails of Joey and Summer, they did find some real spicy emails from Dan Kavanaugh to Joey saying that, you know, basically he didn't feel respected in this business relationship. He didn't feel like he was, he didn't feel like he was getting his just deserves and he wasn't being recognized enough for helping grow the business as much as he did. And he wanted more coins. Okay. So there was a lot of real spicy emails on hit coming from him. So of course, police wanted to talk to him as well. He even went as far as threatening to shut down the business's website that he built, obviously, for the business if Joey didn't pay him more money. So Joey was at the point to where he was going to buy Dan out of his share of the business. He was just done with dealing with Dan and his shenanigans, okay? Now, they also look at the bank records and they saw that Dan had been pulling money out of the account. And 
obviously he said that, you know, he was trying to keep the business afloat, provided that, you know, Joey returned. But basically that was his reasoning for pulling money out of the account. Listening to what's happening so far with this Dan character, he sounds like a worthy suspect. But come to find out, Mr. Dan Cavanaugh was living it up in Hawaii at the time when the McStay family disappeared. So he's checked off the list. So at this point, four years go by and basically the, the case of the McStay family disappearance basically just goes cold. Now I'm taking my Revolution Glow Bronzer in deep and I'm going to bronze up the skin just a little bit. So four years later, on November 11th of 2013, a motorcyclist that's just, you know, minding his business, riding along in the Mojave Desert, he comes across a human skull. Like, I just can't even imagine just minding my business, enjoying my day, and coming across anything of that nature. I don't even know how I would deal. But he comes across and he immediately calls authorities. When authorities get there, they find two shallow graves in the Mojave Desert. And each of these shallow graves has one adult body or the remains of an adult body and a child. So police are already like, it could be. And just a few days later, they are actually identified as being the McStay family. And they're able to identify them only through dental records because the bodies have been out exposed to the elements for so long that that's really all that was left as like an identification marker being dental records. So it, it was a rough, a rough find. Now, when the police examine the remains, they do declare that the manner of death is homicide. And of course, they continue to search for more evidence at the burial sites. So when they search in the graves that they find, they find a sledgehammer, a Stanley sledgehammer in the grave, along with an electrical cord that was used to tie up the bodies. So it's evident that it was a murder. So they determine that the cause of death is being bludgeoned with said sledgehammer that they found buried along with the remains. I'm just gonna take my shade by Sean for the look on the eye today. Now, police also found tire tracks at the scene as well. So they have all this evidence that they can use to try to help them identify the suspect or the murderer of the McStay family. Now, when police examine that sledgehammer, they find paint on the sledgehammer. Now, the significant thing about that, you guys, is that the McStays were getting their home repainted. So there was a whole lot of paint around McStay house at the time. And the police were actually able to match the paint that was on the sledgehammer to the actual paint that was in the home while they were getting it repainted. So we know that the family was not likely murdered in the Mojave Desert. That was more likely just a dumping place and that it most likely happened in their home. Now, mind you, police actually did some really good police work in the years leading up to this discovery. So they still had their truck in custody. So they did some deep processing. Before they didn't process the car as deep as they would if it had initially been ruled a homicide. But now that they had what they needed for it to be classified as a homicide, they processed the heck out of that car. So they processed any type of DNA samples, any type of fingerprints, you name it, they processed it. And when they processed, the DNA, what they found was their truck, the McStay truck that was left at the shopping center, it was not driven by 
anybody in the mixtape family. The truck, y'all, was driven by none other than Mr. Charles Merritt. Now, if you guys remember, Charles Chase Merritt was the subcontractor that they hired into Joey's business and he was kind of the welder of the fountains that they were creating. Now, back when everybody was initially interviewed, Mr. Merritt, he actually took a polygraph and passed at the time. So that just goes to show you all types of manipulative skills that he has. If you can pass a polygraph, you can fool anybody. Once they have this DNA evidence, they go on to find out much, 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 much more about Mr. Merritt. And what they find out is that he actually has a really bad gambling habit. And they also find out that Joey had been bailing him out of his debts from his gambling habit. And we learned that Summer did not like him. She didn't want him around. She just didn't get a good feeling from him. And then on top of that, he owed their family so much money because Joey had bailed him out time and time again from all these debts that he had from his gambling habit. And he also had a record for burglary. Now, it was said that Joey, you know, had a kind heart and he felt like everybody deserved a second chance, which is why he hired Chase on as a subcontractor. But some people just don't deserve a second chance. And unfortunately, Chase Merritt was one of those people. Now, in addition to bailing him out of all his debts with his gambling, he also owed Joey about $42,000 for botched jobs that he had done. So there was a couple of jobs that he was supposed to do something and he just messed it all the way up. They lost money on it. And there were times where he wouldn't meet deadlines for projects. And Joey was nice enough to say, you know what, we'll split the cost of those botched projects, but it was still a pretty penny. It was still $42,000 that he was in debt to Joey on top of Joey covering all his gambling debts because he wanted to give him chance after chance after chance to turn his life around. Now, in addition to finding the DNA of Chase Merritt in the McStay's family truck, they also are able to find that Chase had been forging checks to himself through QuickBooks as a vendor. In their printer, in the printer history at their the McStay family's residence, they can see that he had gone in and he had created these fake checks to him. And he was basically trying to print out those checks but the printer was not yet like connected to the computer so that it wouldn't print it out. It would get the message, but for some reason it wouldn't print it out. So he tried to delete those checks that he tried to write. And luckily the printer saved the history of what was trying to be printed in the actual printer itself. Now the dates on those checks were for two, four, which was the date that the family went missing, but that was a backdated date. He had gone into the home after the family went missing on 2-5 and 2-9, according to the printer history. And that's when he tried to make the checks. He tried to print out those checks twice and to backdate them to the date that the family was last heard from. And obviously he was trying to pick, you know, the last date that they knew that Chase had also talked to Joey as well. Okay, guys, I'm gonna put on my lashes. I will be right back. I got my lashes on, so now we can continue. So in addition to all of this evidence, the DNA evidence, the check printing, forging evidence, the large debt that he was in to Joey for, they also find that his cell phone was pinging off the tower right near the two graves in the Mojave Desert. And this was literally his phone was pinging two days after they went missing. They went missing on February 4th. They have records of his cell phone being in that exact area on the 6th of February, so two days later. So needless to say, in November of 2014, 
Chase Merritt, Charles Chase Merritt, is he is arrested for the murders of Summer, Joey, Gianni, and Joey Jr. mixed day. Now I'm gonna take my minted blush and this is in clay too much. So basically what the police and investigators um, and the district attorney put forward at trial is that, you know, Chase was a troubled guy. He would probably been stealing prior to the checks that he tried to print out on the 5th and the 9th. He had probably already been stealing from Joey and he had been caught or something to that nature and Joey was planning on firing him from his company. And they probably had some type of argument and then Chase followed Joey to his home and that is where the attack took place. And so they think that after he killed everyone, including the children, y'all, he killed the children most likely so that he would not have any witness to what he had done because the kids were three and four. So they were old enough to identify him and they knew who he was because he was a business partner of their father's. So he killed the kids so that they wouldn't be able to identify him in a lineup when asked what happened to his to their parents. So they think that after he killed the family, he drove the bodies to the Mojave Desert and then he took the family truck, dropped it off at the border at the shopping mall that was right at the border and left it there so that police would think that the family just went to Mexico. Police and investigators also thought that he was the one that was putting in the searches of how to get to Mexico, how to cross the border, how to get, you know, how to learn Spanish, getting a Rosetta Stone to learn Spanish to make it look like they had been planning to go to Mexico all along when actually it was Chase who was orchestrating all of this. When I say manipulator, manipulator. Now I'm just gonna take my Becca Chocolate Geode Highlighter. Y'all know I love this stuff. And I'm just gonna highlight my brighter areas. Now his defense basically was it wasn't him. There's not enough actual physical evidence to say that it was him that did it. The case was largely circumstantial outside of his DNA being on the driver's side of the family truck and him being in their home after the the disappearances and him printing checks and all of those things, it was still circumstantial because when they found the sledgehammer and the burial sites, there was no actual DNA on any of those things. So it was really hard to say that he handled those things. He was the one who used it to murder anybody. There was no DNA. There was none of the family's DNA on it. There was none of a killer's or perpetrator's DNA on it either. So their defense was just that it wasn't that it wasn't him. You can't prove that it was him because you don't have any actual physical evidence saying that it was him who committed these heinous acts. The prosecution said, okay, that's all fine and good. But the physical evidence that we do have that you cannot dispute is that your phone was at the burial site two days after they went missing. That's pretty much what sealed the deal for Chase Merritt. Now this trial lasted for 50 days. Now for it to be heavily circumstantial and not enough physical evidence, there was a lot to talk about. 50 days is a long time for, for a trial. And then I'm just gonna take my Fruit Snacks lip gloss from Fenty. This is their gloss cream. Now, evidently they had enough evidence to convince a jury because on June 10th, 2019, Charles Chase Merritt was convicted of the second degree murder of Joseph McStay. And he was convicted of three counts of first degree murder of Summer McStay, Gianni McStay, and Joseph McStay Jr. And that is because obviously while he may have killed Joseph out of a fit of rage, whatever you want to call it, it was still murder. And him killing the rest of the family was premeditated because he killed them so that there would be no witnesses. As a result, he was sentenced to a life sentence for the second degree conviction of the murder of Joseph McStay Sr. And he was also given three death sentences for the murders of 
the rest of the family. Okay, you guys, so that is the story of the disappearance of the McStay family. For years, I saw this story being reported as just a disappearance. Nobody knew where they went. Nobody had any leads. So to finally get some closure as of 2020 when he was sentenced um, for the murders of this entire family, there, this was just a happy family that was enjoying life and they were building a great life for themselves. And Joseph McStay was just a kind hearted man who was trying to give opportunities to those who wouldn't otherwise receive them. And in return, he got his entire family being slaughtered for money. It's a really sad story to share, but at the end of the day, again, I am glad that the extended family, um, of both Summer and Joseph got closure. It isn't ever what you expect, but at least knowing what happened and getting closure and getting a conviction for the person who murdered your family member, that I hope at least in some way helps the family heal. This is my final look. I was feeling a little spicy today. So this is what we're looking like. Let me know what you guys think. I think the skin looks flawless today, honey, flawless. And I am getting ready to go to Mexico. So girl, I ain't got time to be doing my hair. I still haven't packed yet. So let me know what you guys thought about the story today. Let me know what you guys think about the final look as well. I like it. I think it's cute. I think it's effortless. And other than that, y'all, it has been so fun talking to y'all, chatting with y'all about this story in true crime. If you have not subscribed already, please make sure that you do. It means the world to me. Also, make sure you hit that like button so that I know that you are enjoying the things that I'm putting out to the universe. And also, if you don't like it, let me know in the comments down below. Give me suggestions of what you actually want to hear about. I am really working on sharing the smaller, lesser known cases just because I feel like those victims deserve to be talked about and those names deserve to be said and light deserves to be brought to those cases as well. So I am all ears. If there's some interesting cases that you guys know about, hit me up in the comments down below and I will check them out. But other than that, it's been so fun. It's been real y'all. And until next time, I love you guys. Bye.